perfect. Every time I'm like, not very hard. I'm thinking about it. Join then. I'm gonna have you guys kind of pair up two and threes. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. What was that? That was a two. So hopefully you guys were able to watch the video and review the visual field anatomy. I'm not really going to go over specifics of the anatomy. Here's your chance if you didn't. Um, or really technical aspects of Humphreys and Goldmans and things like that. But if you have any questions, ask me and I'll do my best. If I don't know the answer, I'll get back to you later. Um, so here's a normal Goldman visual field. These are normal blind spots for those not familiar with visual fields. It's like you're looking out of the page as the patient. And so what's on the right side is from the patient's right eye. What's on the left is from the patient's left eye. These are the normal physiologic blind spots, which are around 15 degrees temporally of the point of fixation. And a normal fully full visual field is about 60 degrees superior, nasally 60 to 7 inferiorly, and around 90 or so temporally. That would be a full visual field. Uh, Teresa, so we're kind of pairing up twos and threes if you want to join maybe Rachel and over here or whoever you want is fine. Or if you want to do all it on your own, that's great too. Or you guys can make a group of twos, either way. Um, so let's start with some cases. So this is, someone sends you this visual field. This is all you know about the patient. What kind of things are going through your mind when you see this visual field? All we have is this one, which is the left eye. So you guys kind of talk amongst yourself, kind of come up with a clinical scenario for this, what might be causing it, what else you want to know about this patient. Chris, kind of give us some thoughts on this. Um, so we said like it could be like, uh, like a partial arcuate defect or like a sequocentral. Mm -hmm. 
so we would want to know like the age of the patient for sure um, like, I mean obviously any like ocular history do they have a known diagnosis of glaucoma or IIH um, I think those would be very important another eye might be helpful hopefully mm -hmm. visual field is done yeah, both probably. <laughs> so let's say this is a 30 year old and let's say this is the right eye is normal. What's kind of your differential at that point? The right eye is completely normal. Right eye is normal. Thirty year old. Uh, Girl. Girl. Okay. An exam is normal. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, this is all you know. Thirty year old girl. Someone sends you this visual field. What are top five things that you're wondering? What you, things you might think are abnormal. So I'd want to, like, I'd want to look at her nerves, so, like, a young girl like that, if you feel like they may be, like, wonder about inflammatory disease, like, up in her eyes, or something like that. I don't know. So things like eye pain, um, color vision loss, things like that. So uh, let's say it's someone, with, and this is in both eyes. What they, what's your differential for stico central scotomas in both eyes? And say painless. Yeah. Any like systemic diseases? Um, yeah, glaucoma, IIH, I guess MS can be technically a bilateral. Yeah, so bilateral optic neuritis, um, painless, or stichocentral catomas are concerning for nutritional deficiencies, so B12, um, toxicities like ethambutol. Things that give uh, optic neuropathies from medications. Uh, Liebers saw in the differential for bilateral secocentral scotomas. So, a lot of times we get really poor records from outside and we get things like this, but this, even just this alone, gives us a lot of information. It gives us a list of questions that we want to answer when we see the patient. So, this is kind of what gives a secocentral scotoma. So, it's from disorder of the papillomacula bundle, which is right here. The fiber is coming right from the center of the fovea over to the optic disc. These are very uh, nutrient dense areas, so this is why things like nutritional deficiencies particularly affect this area. Uh, and optic neuritis often gives a central scotoma extending over to be a stichocentral scotoma, again, because they're very active um, areas that are easily injured with oxidative stress. So this is an example of a secocentral scotoma. So here's the case. 19-year-old man, painless loss of vision in the left eye, progressed over three days. Uh, three weeks later, had no improvement in that eye, but then developed painless loss in the right eye. So you guys talk kind of what's the top on your differential on this case. I haven't really given you guys too many details, but young guy, otherwise healthy, loses vision one eye, painless, and then not too long later loses vision in the right eye, still painless. How about you guys over here? Any thoughts on that? Kind of a knee-jerk reaction to what you might be thinking first?
So there, it, it could be something like um, vision-threatening papilledema. Usually you'd have like a headache associated with that, though. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit more. Mm -hmm. It could be um, a different type of optic neuropathy that is not an optic neuritis that's causing this. Yeah. Different type of optic neuropathy. Here's his exam, right eyes count fingers, 2400 in the left, no color, he has no APD, eye movements are full. You look at his fundus, he has some peripapular telangiectasia, some pseudoedema from the pool, hearing optic nerves, any clues at this point? Are you surprised he doesn't have an APD? Because, yeah. The, so that, Keep that in mind, and we'll talk about that. In this case, it's not surprising because it's bilateral, but once we go over what it actually is, remind you about the AP. Anyone else have any thoughts or diagnosis at this point? Liebers. Liebers, yep. So, young guy, obtained this vision loss, sequential, rapidly sequential. Um, the other clues are the peripapillary telangiectasia. So the nerve can look pretty normal. It can kind of have a full appearance, but you look around the nerve and it's got these little telangiectasias, but it's more of a pseudoedema appearance than regular, than actual optic disc edema. Uh, so what's the typical visual field, uh, visual field in levers? Kind of already talked about it. Yeah, so bilateral sequocentral scotoma. This is most classic for levers. So this is what the patient had. So going back to Lieber's, so initially when they present in one eye, so if you had seen this guy when you just had the problem in the, whichever the first eye was, and you didn't see a APD, that would be very confusing because he was count fingers, um, no collar vision that I, you're very concerned for an optic neuropathy, but you don't see an APD, so that's very confusing. You might think it's a retina problem. You might think he's faking, which can happen, but for reasons I don't think anyone really knows, um, possibly because the other eye is going to be affected and it's kind of in that pre-monetary phase, but you don't see an APD, and it's not unusual to not see an APD with that first eye that's involved. Uh, either it doesn't involve the ganglion cells in the back that contribute more to the APD, or it's because that other eye is subclinically involved enough to not uh, allow for an APD. So always keep levers in mind when you see something that looks like a bad optic neuropathy, but you're not seeing an APD. Uh, don't discount levers in that situation, especially if it's like the classic young man with levers uh, or with painless vision loss. So someone, how is levers inherited? What is the genetic disorder for levers? Mitochondrial. There's a, about three classic genetic mutations for it, but there's others being discovered. Some mitochondrial levers may not have APD initially. Um, most commonly is gonna eventually be bilateral after usually a couple of months in between their eyes. Secocentral scotoma. Here's another case. So this guy, so pay attention to these things. So you get these visual fields, which look terrible except for some sparing, but he has 20-20 vision. So what do you think is going on with this lesion? This visual field. Yeah. You also see his foveal thresholds are 30 on the left, 39 on the right, which goes with his, with his 20 20 vision. Central Island Division left.
um, xenophobia, uh, resulting, in, resulting in 2020 vision. So things that can result in profound peripheral vision loss, like severe glaucoma or um, like an RP. Um, we were talking about what a CRA do that even if it was a robust ciliar retinal artery, it probably wouldn't end up in 2020 vision. And then Bilateral would be unusual. Yeah. A very lucky event for yes. <laughs> um, Anything yeah. else? So, so you kind of labeled it as constriction with sparing the macula. So, where would you localize that? You also already mentioned the retina can cause that. Yeah, you could also have his um, cortical, uh, like his uh, bilateral. Retina, bilateral optic neuropathy is probably less likely. So retina or bilateral cortical, like you mentioned, are probably the two most common. So this guy is actually, he was, I don't know, he's about 40. He was, it's a very sad story, was hanging a, a flag up at a restaurant on Veterans Day like a year ago and fell off the ladder and had a hemorrhage in the back of his head, went to the hospital, had that treated, then eventually decompensated and was herniating and stroked out his bilateral PCAs while herniating. He stroked out his bilateral occipital lobes. So this is what he had. He also became deaf at the time also. So doing a good deed and became Helen Keller. But so you see, going back to the visual field, it's a little bit not as bad in the left in both eyes. If you look closely at his MRI, it's uh, not as bad on the right, but this is a bilateral occipital lesion. You can see it's sparing the tip of the occipital lobes for the most part, which is why he has really good central vision. Um, so just to kind of briefly review, so the occipital lobes, the most posterior part of the occipital lobes is your macula, central vision, more anterior in the uh, occipital lobes is the uh, peripheral vision. So if you spare the poles of the occipital lobes, you have the potential to spare your macula or your central vision, um, which is what he did, which is among all the bad things, one of the better things that happened to him. You can see this is the contusion from his fall. The vision loss is all from back here. So here's just a CAT scan. CAT scans are not quite as easy, except for maybe our neurologist, to read. Uh, what do you think the visual field will be in this patient? So what, what's wrong with the brain in this CAT scan? Is it normal or is it abnormal?
actually, this is the abnormal size. You see this dark so strokes that are subacute to chronic appear to dark on CAT scan for all you ophthalmologists out there. Um, so this side is normal, but you see this uh, hypodensity is what you termino the terminology for it. That's subacute to acute uh, chronic stroke. So acute strokes, first 24 hours look normal on CAT scan. So this one's a little bit tougher because MRIs are much easier to show things like this. But I didn't have one on this patient. But so where are we in the brain? So this is the abnormal side. Roughly, where are we? Occipital lobe. It's hard to tell on this. Let's say it's the inferior occipital lobe where we are. What is the visual field effect with that? Yep, so on the right. Right. So left occipital because it's the right superior quadrantopia. <laughs> so this was her visual field. So right superior quadrantopia, monomous quadrantopia from a left inferior occipital infarct. So here's the case: 27-year-old woman. She's five and a half weeks pregnant. Brad, you know this patient, came with vision loss in both eyes, one week, and a headache. What are you concerned about right now? What are you really concerned about in a pregnant lady with a headache, acute onset? What was that? That's a good one, yeah. Venous sinus thrombosis. So hyperchiral state, headache, pregnant lady. So this is her exam, 20-20 uh, vision, has no APD, color is normal. Sounds fine, right? <laughs> Send her home. What else do you want to know for her? Morning. I mean, I would want to get a visual field on her. <laughs> <laughs> Complaining lady. Yeah. So these are nerves. What's her visual field potentially going to look like? So first, what's going on for all the non-ophthalmologists in the room with her nerves? Yeah. So a little touch of discotema or. <laughs> <laughs> severe optic disc edema, both eyes. Um, so you guys talk, what's the visual field defects most commonly with optic disc edema from papilledema? change. Uh, blind spots are one of the first things we see. Um, nasal depression is a very common one and then the then it starts to get constricted. So these people often won't notice that they're losing vision because their acuity is 20-20 until their fields get so constricted. So just relying on the subjective um, nature of the vi patient's vision is not great. You have to actually go check the visual fields formally if possible. So I saw this lady in clinic and these were her visual fields. She was pregnant. So this isn't really an IAH talk, but we'll kind of go over a little bit. So she's pregnant, she's got these visual fields. So you're worried or you're not worried about this patient. She's got severe papilledema. 
I'll tell you, she didn't have a venous sinus thrombosis, so she just has elevated pressure for no other reason. For those with more experience with IAH, what are you kind of thinking is your next step in this at this point? So again, not an IH talk, but this is vision threatening IH. So you have to do something more aggressive, like lumbar drains, possibly fenestrations if needed. So she already had her MRI, which is normal. Otherwise, opening pressure was 56, so very high. Otherwise, CSF was normal. So she was admitted for lumbar drain to kind of temporize things, drain the fluid, repeat visual fields. Uh, we started diamops at the same time. And then the plan was if visual fields didn't improve, then do optic nerve sheet fenestrations. So this is kind of a gradual progression of her visual fields. So first time I saw her left eye, right eye. This is after lumbar drain for, this is five days later. And so you see improvement there, improvement in the right eye. So we kind of stuck with things with the diamox. She continued to improve. And this is uh, about two months after I first saw her. So luckily, luckily for her, she did okay with diamox. So um, always keep in mind vision threatening IAH that they have severe uh, visual field loss. Then that's something to be concerned about, and you want to be more aggressive with that with lumbar drains, possibly optic nerve sheath fenestrations, things like that. So uh, just to review fields in IAH, so we're with papilledema, enlarged blind spots, nasal depression, diffuse constriction, last thing that goes is the visual acuity. I have a question about that, Dr. C. So this might be wrong too, but there's a question that I just had that said, what's the most common visual field defect seen in IIH? The answer is partial arcuate with or without enlarged blind spot, and an enlarged blind spot being the second most common. Is that true? My experience, I feel like, enlarged blind spot is most common. Right. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, what's the question from? Opto questions. Yeah. Can I deal with that on the textbook, or on the, on the boards? I mean, it says that it was, I haven't looked up the study, honestly, but it says this was what was reported in the IIH Type, uh, treatment trial. So I don't know. I just yeah. didn't know. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, um, I don't know the board question answer to that. Okay. In the experience, it's in large blind spot. Okay. though. that's what I thought. But but you well, do see those arcuate defects a reason. lot too, and the, I see the nasal depression a lot also. Yeah. When you do image, would you do it with contrast or prelude? Um. It's controversial, depends on the center, usually. You can. Um, I don't think this lady had contrast. Don't, well, apparently she did, if I wrote that right. Uh, some people will do contrast, some people won't, and in pregnant ladies. Um, there's, with gadolinium, I think iodine is contraindicated, but, uh, there's no 100% contraindication to GAD, though. Did she give, did she, did she have her baby yet? Yeah. Okay. She's, she was five and a half weeks pregnant on September 5th. Oh. Because oh. she was really worried, I think, about the acetylzole. Yeah, right? someone had recommended her Diamox, which is, doesn't have great evidence that it's harmful to the baby, but there's, in animals, it's potentially harmful. But there's no real human evidence that is harmful, so some people are hesitant to take it. But she's been on two grams since September. Her OBGYN is fine with it. Most people are generally fine with it. It's just kind of educating the patient that we don't have great evidence one way or the other. But um, a lot of cases are reported where there's no effect from Diamox. So here's the 33-year-old woman, had trouble finding birds in the sky, reading first parts of words, seeing the mouse on the computer screen. Slowly progressive, she doesn't really know when it started, but it's probably been a few years. Thinks both eyes equally affected, otherwise healthy, no family history of vision loss. So 
for exam. So you can get to 2020, both eyes, kind of with eccentric vision. Colors decrease both eyes. Pupils equal. There's questionably a trace right APD. Eye movements otherwise normal. So these are her optic nerves. Anyone quickly want to say what they see with these optic nerves? Disc margins look pretty crisp. She has a normal cup to disc ratio. If anything, her um, optic nerves appear slightly hyperemic, um, but I don't see any optic disc pallor. Um, no blurred disc margins. They look fairly healthy to me. Exciting. No answers yet for her vision. So, can you predict the visual field just based on her history? guys kind of discuss what you think her visual field is going to be. Probably a small area affecting somewhere in the center. She's having trouble finding little things. So this was her Humphrey. So you can see up here, that's, you can't really tell, but down here you see the central lesion here, central here, possibly more on the left side. So you've got these little central scotomas. So this is Goldman, the central scotoma. To localize that. Sorry, the gold. Teresa, your group. Localized bilateral central scotomas. Bilateral, it's bilateral sensual scotomas. Um, optic nerve could be possible too. Bilateral optic neuropathies can give you sensual scotomas. So OCT RNFL is pretty normal. So this is our OCT of the macula. Non ophthalmologist, this is through the phobia. This is a normal foveal depression. Any of you ophthalmologists want to say what you see on this? Lost the, uh, like the, the ellipsoid zone, like right in the... Yeah. Right in the center. Yeah. So does this correspond with her visual field defects here? Yep. So she's got a retinal problem causing bilateral central scotomas. So she went to Dr. Bernstein, 
Um, ERG was actually normal, but he's concerned for a cone dystrophy in her. Uh, she's getting genetic testing. So, it's a neuro ophthalmologist, see retina things too. Here's a case, 15 year old girl was in a car accident a month prior to me seeing her. Her complaints in her vision were just blurry vision at distance and double vision at near, had headaches, nausea, some neck pain. Uh, went to another eye doctor, was told she had peripheral vision loss. So if you take out that last sentence, that kind of sounds typical of a post-concussion patient, blurry vision, especially double vision at near because they get conversions insufficiency. But since this is a visual field lecture, why might she have some peripheral vision loss after a car accident? Is that a minor car accident? Is that normal or is that surprising? Yeah, you wouldn't really expect a minor car accident. It's probably not going to cause peripheral vision loss. Maybe if there was head trauma, there's a optic neuropathies, but it wasn't really any head trauma. So vision's 20-20, color's full, pupils are normal, eye movements are normal, um, had some conversions insufficiency, consistent with post-concussion syndrome. These were her optic, or her fundus photos, which are normal. These are her visual fields. So what do you guys think about these visual fields? How would you approach this patient at this point Given these visual fields, she, I mean, her main complaints were blurry vision at distance, double at near. It wasn't, I can't see anymore. I think a 15 year old girl who underwent a traumatic event, you always have to keep in mind functional vision loss. Do a tangent screen. Yeah. So tell me about the tangent screen. What do you do with that? So when they move back, you expect the field to expand. It stays the same. Sometimes it gets smaller, then that's highly suspicious for non-physiologic vision loss. So you could get a gold mon. You could do a gold mon too as another option. Your gold mon is also concerning. So she. So 15 year old, I was highly suspicious for non-physiologic. I did a tangent screen on her. Sometimes she expanded, sometimes she didn't. Um, it's hard to really label people as non-physiologic though, as post-traumatic 15 year old girl. I was thinking she was gonna be normal. <laughs> but I got a ERG, which was abnormal. And again, went to Dr. Bernstein, <laughs> concerned she has retinitis pigmentosa. What? So, one of the things that, looking back, made me, should have made me more or less likely to think it was non-physiological is that she wasn't complaining of vision loss. Right. This was just incidentally found. She was, didn't come in saying, I can't see. It was just double vision at near, blurry vision. Um, and she's had this forever, most likely, so she's never really known any difference. Um, so it wasn't until more questioning that they kind of found out that her night vision was not that great and things like that. But so always, I really hate non-physiologic disorders because you get stuff like this when it's totally real, when it looks otherwise not. So you have to be really careful before you label someone non-physiologic. Before I forget, so I forgot to make a quiz. So I'm going to make a quiz and email it to you guys. So you guys can just write your email address and I'll email it later. Thank you. Now we just have some kind of rapid fire visual fields. So I'll sh show you one, discuss real quick, and then someone shout it out. Just what the defect is, where it localizes.
topless discs. Yeah. So yeah. So like they only have the inferior disc. Yeah. yeah. So optic uh, nerve anomaly. Yeah. So it could be bilateral optic nerve problems causing inferior altitudinal defects. Uh, could be brain also. So posterior superior occipital lobe could cause that field defect. But this one. Right, all the temporal or inferior occipital. So this is just again showing the occipital lobe, posterior occipital lobe. For the central vision, the macula, peripheral vision is represented anteriorly. So this is a small. So this would be you expect this to be more posterior occipital lobe, given this small, more central superior quadrant synopia. How about this one? What's the name for that kind of visual field defect? Well, we know that the right eye is severely affected, which localizes to anterior to the chiasm. Mm -hmm. We know that the left eye has a temporal defect, which localizes to yeah, be junctional scotoma. Yeah. So a junctional scotoma causes a temporal defect in one eye and a central defect or kind of diffuse optic neuropathy defect in the other eye. So that localizes to the chiasm, but it's involving more of the right optic nerve than it is the left. That's why you get so much involvement of the right optic nerve, and it extends back to the chiasm and affects those fibers that cross and causes that temporal defect on the left eye. So this localizes to the optic chiasm a little bit more anterior in the right optic nerve, though. So you think of things like pituitary tumors, any optic chiasm lesion. about this one.
this visual field defect plus a right APD. So what's the visual field defect? Has a right APD. Is that weird? Are there functional visual field? So this localizes to the left optic tract specifically because is on the left part of the optic tract, the on the left optic tract, but more fibers decusate than don't. So the right optic nerve has more fibers than are hidden. Yep. So that's exactly right. So our temporal fields are bigger than our medial nasal fields. So there's an overrepresentation of that temporal visual field. So there's more fibers from that uh, from the, the medial fibers that cross. So the optic tract has an overrepresentation of the contralateral eye. So when you take out the optic tract, it's still asymmetrically involving that contralateral eye, which is why you'll get an APD. It's usually not a huge APD; it's small, but. So if you see a homonymous hemianopia with an APD and you get a little confused, don't be confused, it's probably an optic tract lesion. But this one. Scotoma, RP. No retina problems. Localizes to tell me a few disorders that you're looking for. What's the differential diagnosis for an optic chiasm lesion? Pituitary adenomas, apoplexy, meningiomas, what's the vascular ones? Neurism. So a lesion of the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus can give these very strange looking homonymous hemianopias. Yeah. Yeah. Junctional scotoma. So you have a central scotoma in the right left eye, superior temporal, so it's catching those medial fibers that are coming. So it's pushing up from the bottom to the chiasm. So the lesion is on the left side? It's at the chiasm involving more of the left side. Okay. More of the left nerve, of the, more of the optic nerve on the left side. Okay. More of just the crossing fibers from the right. So this is sparing temporally on the left side. So you have a, otherwise a left monomous hemianopia. So this localizes to the right occipital, but more anterior, um, but not totally anterior because it's sparing some there. And how about this? Make up the clinical scenario for this. Left eye looks like 
like clover leaf like so lazy patient with something going on in the right eye <laughs> I got tired I think of that's eye. completely connected <laughs> <laughs> so I made these oh <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty proud of this. <laughs> but a little bit over on the left, though. That's awesome. My clover leaf isn't perfect either, but it's not too bad. <laughs> so, any questions? That's all I've got for you today. That's good. Thank, Thank you. you. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really good. Did you do them at the same time? What? You did them at the same time. Same so you want to have a Yeah. <laughs> so.